I prayed for this service today like I, like I normally do. I pray that when we gather together, it would be a good time and, and we'd uh, be challenged and grow in our faith. Prayed a little extra harder uh, this week and uh, prayed for you. And I certainly prayed for myself that I'd be able to deliver it in the way that God wants me to. Um, I want to talk to you about something this morning that's not weird or kind of obscure. It's, it's a passage I hope, that's not something I hope to convince you of. It's, it's something that we don't hear preached very often. But I think certainly in the American church, we need to hear it more. It's not a popular message. So uh, if you feel like you need to go, <laughs> don't be embarrassed. <laughs> we'll just wave to you as you leave. <laughs> no. So... So I, uh, I met John when I was uh, a young man. A uh, little background to my story. So uh, I'm the youngest of three boys. And at eight years old, my mom started taking us to church. She had met some friends down in Florida a few years ago when we were living there for a little while that were Christian. They opened her up to the gospel. They shared it with her. And so... We went through a hard time in my family, and my mom decided it's time to get to church. So, eight years old, she dragged me off to church. I loved church. It was a cool place. Um, I learned a lot about God. I learned a lot about the scriptures. And I met a guy there that was part of the church. His name was John. John was about 6'4", and so when you're eight years old, it's like, I hugged Andrew uh, was standing on the platform. I said, hey, we're the same size now. <laughs> I needed a little lift. But um, yeah, so John was, um, he was just a man in the church. I used to watch him. I knew two things about John. Sorry, I, I, got, I didn't expect this to happen. It happened at first service. <clears throat> I'll try to pull myself together. I knew two, two things about John. I knew he Loved his wife, and I knew he loved the Lord. I could just tell by the way he treated her that he loved her. And I could tell by the way he worshiped that he loved his God. I used to look up to him and say, wow, man, you know, he's like an oak tree, you know, sturdy, strong. He didn't mentor me. We never went out. He always greeted me. He knew I was in sports, so he did. How's your sports going? We talked for a few minutes. And that'd be the extent of it, you know. So fast forward, I get away from the Lord in my in my teen years, and I come finally come back to church at 19. I make a commitment to Christ, and that radically changed my life. In uh, John at the time, <clears throat> he, was, uh, he was dealing with cancer. And uh, in life, he was successful. I mean, he had a regular job, and he also owned a Dairy Queen, which was very successful. But when he got sick, he had to let that go. And, you know, and now he's looking at things, and they're getting worse, and he wants to take care of his wife. So he decides he's going to open another Dairy Queen just so she can be taken care of, you know? And so, I'm 19, I'm, I need a job. So he comes to me, he says, hey, uh, I wanna train you. I want you to run my Dairy Queen. 19 years old, you can do anything, right? You can run a Dairy Queen. So, I said, all right. <clears throat> so John, and this was a startup, I mean, you know, new location, no history there, and uh, <clears throat> he'd come in every day and train me how to run the store. He had built a loft above, his, uh, above the back of the store because <clears throat> on the days when he was in a tremendous amount of pain or difficulty, he would go up there and he would stay. And uh, so I learned how to run the store. It wasn't a short time afterward that things got so bad for him that, um, that he had to sell the store. 
he had his wife Rita, which was, Rita was quite the character. Rita was, um, she was very nice, but she wasn't warm, you know? She was a friend of my mom's, and I knew her, again, since I was a kid, but I'd hear her talk about her and John. And um, <clears throat> so they sold the store, and then I heard John had gotten worse. So I decided, hey, one day I'm going to go. He's in the hospital now. He's dying. John believed in healing. I believe in healing. If it's God's will, okay. So here I am. I'm a young Christian. And I said to my mom, hey, I'm going to go see John. Can you give me some passages to read to him? I wanted to go and encourage him, you know. So she gave me a couple things out of Psalms. And I'm going there, and I'm like, young guy. I'm going to go there and bless John, you know. <clears throat> so I walk in, and he's the same size, laying in the bed, but he's nowhere near the man he was. He's skin and bones now. And uh, he had, um, had radiation done. It had burned out his saliva glands pretty much, so he would have to keep drinking to be able to speak. He didn't speak much then. So I went in and I was like, hey, John, you know, he's like, yeah. I said, John, you got a favorite passage that you like out of the Bible? I figured that, that's a good start, you know. He says, yeah, I do. He said, read John 15. And I read the whole chapter. And I looked at him, he goes, read it again. And I read it again. And he says, read it again. And I read it again. And then he said to me, do you know what that means? I don't remember what I said. It's probably something stupid. <laughs> so when I get to the end of the message, I want to tell you what John told me, what it meant. I want to talk to you about, um, I want to talk to you about suffering today. And I hope we can get an understanding of what it's all about and accept it and learn how to embrace it. Because I think if we can embrace this part of our walk in our life, I think we can become unstoppable as believers. And I want to try to answer the question this morning, can suffering and joy share the same space? We love the good parts of Scripture the blessings, the love, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy. We love to hear about that. And those are so important in our faith. But when Jesus calls us to follow him to a real true commitment, he says you need to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. And I see from scripture that when Jesus talked about commitment, the crowds thinned. People walked away. And Jesus was really saying, do you really want to do this? Do you really want to do this? Jesus tells us that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. Isaiah chapter 53, speaking prophetically of Jesus, reminds us that he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then we go to Matthew chapter 8, and Jesus has an encounter with a scribe in verse 19. The scribe comes and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. I'll follow you. And Jesus looks at him in verse 20, says, foxes have their holes and birds have their nests. But the Son of Man has no place to put his head. He also encourages us to endure suffering because it has significance in our lives. There's benefits to suffering. Have you ever walked through a situation in life and left you wondering why God would allow that to happen to you and you experienced the hurt and the pain and even discouragement that comes from it? There are no doubts that um, there are challenges in life 
Some of the challenges and difficulties we face are because of poor choices. I'm not talking about that this morning. If I make a poor choice, you make a poor choice, we gotta live with the consequences, don't we? That's not suffering for God. That's suffering because we did something dumb, all right? But for every believer, the re reality is that we walk through hardship and experience pain and deal with sorrow. Jesus told us pain and suffering would be a part of our lives. John 16, 33 is, I have said these things to you, that in me you will have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And then earlier in that same chapter, verse 20 says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. I love that Jesus doesn't simply say we'll have trials and sorrows and difficulties in life and then he kind of leaves us to figure it out. Instead, he promises joy and reminds us that he's overcome the world, meaning your suffering is with purpose. So I want to look at a few things about suffering this morning. I told you it wasn't going to be a popular message. Suffering helps us develop our character. James chapter 1, verses 1 uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 say, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking anything. Count it all joy. Philip's translation for that phrase is, Embrace it like a friend. Embrace it like a friend. In other words, when sorrow comes, when difficulty comes, we're supposed to embrace that. Now, the main passage that I want to share from is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. It reads like this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange is happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. You've, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in his name. For it is time for judgment to begin in the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarce are, is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Verse 12 talks about being a follower, and it's not going to be easy. Suffering is part of life. It's part of the Christian life, and it's even called painful suffering. Now, believers in other parts of the world, they understand this. We don't understand this in our American culture at this point. But when John, um, when Peter opens up and says, beloved, the context of that word beloved means dear friend. The phrase actually means those who are deeply loved by God. So he starts out, he's going to share something with us that is really significant in our life, but he wants us to know that we're dearly loved by God. I want you to remember that this morning, that God loves you dearly, because it's huge. It's huge. God loves you deeply, deeply and profoundly. Therefore, don't be surprised when you suffer as a Christian. Now, most of us don't understand or think that way. We're surprised when trials come and where they come from. And we certainly think that we don't deserve them. Peter even calls them in this passage fiery trials. That's actually, in the original text, is one word. It really means burning. Do not be surprised when the burning comes upon you to test you. Now, back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Peter writes, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, 
you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing gen, it tested the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fiery trial. When I think of that, I think of a story in the Bible. Back in the Old Testament. Story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, if you've been around church life at all, you've probably heard this story a little bit. I loved it when I was a kid. I loved hearing that story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were three guys. Um, they were Jewish. They'd been taken captive in the Babylon Empire. King Nebuchadnezzar was in charge. He served the government. They served the government. They served the government well. God blessed them in everything that they did. His favor was on them. So King Nebuchadnezzar builds this giant statue of himself. And he says to the people, when you hear the trumpet, you got to bow down and worship. He gathers all the people together. Trumpet goes off. Everybody bows. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't bow. King hears about it. He's really annoyed. He's furious. So he says to them, I'll give you another chance. When you hear the trumpet sound, bow down. They wouldn't bow. Okay? And they said, we don't need to defend ourselves. The God we serve is able to deliver us. And even if he doesn't deliver us, okay, we will not bow. And sometimes things happen in our lives and we say, why me? When maybe we should be saying, why not me? Chuck Swindle says if you view life as a school, uh, school classroom and God as the instructor, it should come as no surprise when we encounter pop quizzes and, uh, and periodic examinations. Maturity in the Christian life is measured by our ability to withstand the tests that may come our way without having them shake our foundation or throw us into emotional tailspins. In our trials, in our difficulties, in our sorrow, God's building character into our life. Second thing I see is sorrow brings us closer to God. Verse 13 says, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Insofar is a word that really means participate or share in, that we would share in the suffering. Philippians 3, 10, 11 says, That I may know him, in the power of his resurrection. We love that. Man, we love to know God in his power. Don't we? But it doesn't stop there. It says, and may share his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. We love the power but we have difficulty with the suffering. To participate is a, it's a verb form of the Greek word koinonia, which means or translated fellowship. To most of us, fellowship's gonna happen after we leave here. We're gonna go into the family room and that's a necessary part of our life and a necessary part of the church life that we would go in there and we would share fellowship. Fellowship's when we go to a picnic or invited over to somebody's house, we share fellowship. But here Peter speaks of having fellowship in the suffering of Christ. Our suffering joins us with Jesus in a way like nothing else can. It means to share or have fellowship with him during the difficult times in our life. And I think it means then to know him more intently. Suffering for or with Christ means greater intimacy with Christ. It's a deeper awareness of our Lord's presence and a greater sense of fellowship with him. And pain and suffering should cause us to run to our God in need. When we realize that we're not in control, we need to cling to our God. 
who alone is our rock and our sure foundation. We sang about it this morning. And Peter wants us to understand that nothing moves us closer to Christ than when we go through hard times. It's almost like, if I was going to try to illustrate it, just say, this is us here, and Jesus is over here. And the goal is, we want to get closer to him, don't we? So we go to church, we fellowship, we have a devotional life, we pray, we give, we do all those things. And those are vital parts to our life. And as we're doing that, we're moving closer, becoming more like Jesus. But I really believe that we'll never get right next to him until we understand what it is to suffer like he suffered. If you want to get intimate with God, then you need to know that you're going to go through some difficulties. It's just part of it. It's not that um, suffering in itself brings us to Christ, but it's the suffering and what it does in us and to us. And God intends that our hard times, our suffering, move us from where we are to where Christ is. Suffering should drive us to dependence on God. It should cause us to draw closer. I also see in this passage that suffering should cause us to rejoice. And continuing on in verse 13, it says that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now, in the world that we live in, there's a distinct and radical distinction between joy and sorrow. People tend to say when you're glad, you can't be sad. And when you're sad, you can't be glad. Sorrow and pain, we try to keep it away at all costs because we like the opposite. We like the gladness and the happiness. That's what we really desire. And the vision offered by Jesus stands in sharp contrast to the worldly vision. And Jesus shows us in his teaching and in his lifestyle that their joy is often hidden in the midst of sorrow. He did say, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. Unless you lose your life, you'll never find it. Unless the Son of Man dies, he cannot send the Spirit. And so Jesus calls us to suffering. Not a popular message. Jesus actually calls our pain labor pains. He says in John chapter 16, he says, a woman in childbirth suffers because the time has come. But when she has given birth to the child, she forgets the suffering and her joy that a human being is being born into the world. And then we come to Matthew chapter 5. It's the be attitudes. Be attitude. And it goes through all the things that talk about what you can go through if you're persecuted, if you be a peacemaker, you're blessed, all these things that, you know, that can occur in our lives. And if we follow through with that, and, you know, God will bless us. And then it comes down to verses 11, 12, the last verses of that particular passage is blessed are those when others revile against you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you and so we see here that um, we're called we're called to rejoice Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Jesus endured the cross, and the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, despising its shame, and he was seated at the right hand of God. So the cross becomes the powerful symbol of death and life, of suffering and joy, of defeat and victory. The cross shows us the way that suffering and joy can share the same space. And then going on in this passage, I see suffering is for the cause of Christ. Verse 14, it says, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Some of you have experienced what it is to suffer as a Christian. Now, I, I need to make this distinction, and I didn't do it in the first service, but... If you're a weird Christian, 
you could bring some suffering on yourself that's not necessary, okay? And you may think that you're suffering for the sake of Christ when you're suffering because I'll leave it at that. I'm not talking about that this morning. I'm talking about suffering for the cause of Christ. Some of you have experienced it in your, in your family, among your friends. See, some of you have probably lost jobs because you had a, had a standard that you wouldn't cooperate with on the job, and they just said, well, we're just going to let you go. I saw this in my family. Uh, I, I shared it before, but so my mom's a Christian now. She comes from a Catholic background. Her dad is a Knights of Columbus guy, like high up, you know, and he totally rejected her because she left the Catholic Church and she was following Jesus. He wouldn't speak to her. We'd go to dinner every Sunday. I picture it now. It was down in the basement. He had his white guinea t-shirt on. <laughs> the sauce was on. We'd come in. She'd say hello to him. He wouldn't answer. He wouldn't even look at her. This went on for years. But for my mom to endure that, Jesus had so radically changed her life that there was no way that she was going back. She met her Savior. And it cost her, but she was okay with it. Now, they did reconcile on his deathbed. He did apologize for the way he treated her. I don't even know if she needed to experience that. She was just like, she had a great relationship with my grandmother. My grandmother was in between. She never got, my grandmother never spoke up to my grandfather. Never. Okay? He was a tough guy. But my mom endured that because she knew Jesus. So some of you have experienced that. And Paul says when we suffer for our faith, we participate in the suffering of Christ. Verse 14 says, you are blessed because the spirit of, the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. We need to understand that it's a privilege that the world would treat us the way it treated Christ, to be so closely identified with him. To suffer for, as a Christian or being a Christian is nothing to be ashamed, ashamed of, but praise God that you have that connection with his name. Then verse 15 and 16, it says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in his name. Murder, thief, evildoer, and meddler. You know what a meddler is, right? Somebody that gets in someone else's business. You put it in the same category. Oh my goodness, I never knew that. Okay. But it says that those who receive a guilty verdict because they're a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or they have criminal behavior in their life, they simply are receiving the just, just punishment for their crime. There's nothing honorable in that. On the other hand, if you suffer because you are acting and living like a Christian, you can wear a badge of honor because you're bringing glory to God. Next thing I see in this passage of Scripture is Suffering begins at home. Verses 17 and 18. For it's time for judgment to begin in the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Suffering on an individual basis is a test of our faith to see if we'll overcome. But suffering also tests the church. Suffering for the cause and name of Christ is becoming more and more common. Like I said earlier, it hasn't really arrived where we live right now. In some ways it has, but not like other people in other countries, what they have to deal with. Suffering for the cause and name of Christ 
is becoming more common. But suffering sets, separates the righteous from the religious. It said in the end times that those who have, have itching ears, those that don't want to endure sound doctrine, they're, they're not going to stick around when suffering becomes the norm rather than the exception. And this is the way that God uses to separate the genuine true believers from those who are seeking only the benefits of the kingdom. Hey, I love to be blessed. I love to experience, you know, God and all his goodness, and I do, you know? But if that's all I'm in it for, I'm gonna be in trouble when suffering comes because I'm not gonna understand it. So will we bear the insults and whatever the world throws at us? Will we suffer and rejoice as we continue to follow Christ and continue to do good? The other thing I see is that our suffering, in our suffering, God comforts us. The Bible never instructs us to suppress our pain and our suffering, but instead shows us where to direct it. God invites us to draw near to him and that might, and we might experience that we might experience his peace, his healing, and his closeness. That we may experience his glory. We heard in our reading this morning, Psalm 38, 18, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God knows when you're brokenhearted, and he knows when you're crushed. And he's not gonna just leave you there. He's going to come close to you. He's going to surround you and be there for you. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, uh, so through Christ, we share abundantly in his comfort, too. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If you are comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our suffering, you also share in our comfort. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, and let me tell you something, this guy suffered, man. He suffered, shipwrecked, beaten, imprisoned for the sake of Christ. Yet he knew that the God that he served was going to be there for him and bring comfort. And so I say to you this morning, suffering doesn't have to have the last word. Instead, Paul points us to what he found in suffering. And he starts out those verses and he said blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort and he lets us know right from the beginning all right that God is going to be there for us he's the God of mercy and the God of all comfort he's making a promise that those who belong to Christ will suffer but they'll also receive comfort now affliction is not an if you know, there's a difference between if and when. If Paul said to you, if you suffer affliction, that means it might happen and it might not happen. Probability. But when he says when, it's for certain. Okay? But as we continue on in our Christian walk, there's a certainty to Christians that comfort will come to those who suffer. We want comfort, but we need to understand that it comes along with affliction and suffering. Suffering and, 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 and comfort are intertwined. Something that we're not really comfortable with. Something that we don't really understand. Something that's hard for us to embrace. But suffering has a purpose, and Paul knew what he was suffering for and who he was suffering for. And in his suffering, he knew his Savior was with him. He wasn't alone. Christ is our companion in our suffering, and we have an assurance of his presence. Going on in verse 4, it says, And we in turn who comfort others with the comfort we have been comforted with 
When God brings comfort in our lives through our suffering, it's not just for us. It's for the opportunity to share that comfort with somebody else that's going through a difficult time. And then it goes on and it says, for if we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our suffering, you will also share in our comfort. The last thing that I see about suffering is suffering causes us to look to the cross. Back in 1 Peter 4, 19, it says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And when I stand back and I look at this passage of scripture that we're looking at today, it strikes me that you'll never believe it unless you believe in the sovereignty of God over every detail of your life. Peter's teaching that, that every trial that comes our way is under God's control. And nothing can touch us that does not first pass through the Father's loving hands. We will never believe in the sovereignty of God in our trials unless we believe in the love of an everlasting Father. And we will never be convinced of God's love unless we fix our gaze on the cross. I want to challenge you this morning to see the cross. Because in that cross is suffering. And in that cross is joy. And when we start there and we begin to look at the cross, we see that our troubles, our suffering, will come into proper focus. Because apart from the cross, it makes no sense to rejoice in suffering. Remember John? I read John 15 three times. He asks me, do you know what that means? I'm looking at a dying man, a skeleton of what he was, a man that you could see the pain on his face. And he motions me to come close because he can't talk very loud. And I come in close and he says, Five words to me. Stay connected to the vine. Whew. He wanted to leave me with a message that I've never forgotten. Here's a man who's suffering and dying. You know, he's not concerned about himself and what he's going through. He went to tell a young man, a new Christian, the real purpose. Stay connected to the vine. There's one time, there's times in my life where I got somewhat disconnected. I'll be honest with you. You know, you ever have those moments where you just feel like you're not connected with God? I had to go back and reconnect. I had to remember what John told me. Almost 50 years later, his words still call me back to the vine. In his suffering, he was able to see the glory of God. In his suffering, he understood that it wasn't about what's happening in my life right now. It's about honoring God and glorifying him. It's about impacting someone else's life while he was suffering. And so I encourage you, to stay connected to the vine. Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning for this time together. Thank you for your word that guides and directs us. Lord, I thank you that you said it wasn't going to be easy, but you promised to walk each step of the way with us. God, that we would know your comfort and your strength during whatever you go through. Lord, I'm sure there's people here this morning that are struggling Maybe they're suffering. Maybe they're going through affliction, whatever it is. God, I pray that they would look to you, and God, that they would allow the comfort of the Spirit to be with them.
And God, in their suffering, that they would, they would see that suffering and joy can share the same space. Help us in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.